Today, we're gonna to be starting the build on this huge 116 inch Skywing Edge. And I'm gonna be building it on electric power, the Scorpion's biggest airplane freestyle motor today. Let's get to building. The kit comes in a total of three boxes. Inside the first box, there is everything well packaged. The fuselage is uh, inside supported by a bunch of foam formers. And then around it is placed the rudder, the two elevators, the landing gear, and also a box that is full of all of the accessories. Moving on to the second box, inside this one there's the wings and also the wing tube and the stab tubes. And inside the wings are packaged on some foam formers and everything arrived in perfect condition and undamaged. Inside the third box there is the cowl. And then inside the cowl, they stuffed a few other items such as the spinner. Now that we've got everything unpacked, let's go ahead and go through and do a detailed roll call of everything that you're gonna find in this kit. Of course, you're gonna have yourself the fuselage, cowl, two wings, two stabs, the rudder, wing tubes, landing gear, wheel pants, all of that stuff, of course, you're gonna have. But one thing that I wanna focus on is all of the other accessories which are included in this kit. In addition to the carbon fiber landing gear and wheel pants, you also find two really big and really nice wheels. These are a plastic core with a foam tread. They seem quite durable and are very light. Also, we have Skywing's patented axle design. I'll get into more details later, but it's really simple and slick and helps support your wheel pants so that they last longer. There is a pre-plumbed fuel tank, as well as some fuel line and other fuel fittings, straps, stuff like this, all for mounting a fuel tank into this plane. I won't need these because I'm doing a giant electric power system in this plane. There is two wheel cuffs along with some rubber edge protector to go around them. There's a single bag full of ball links and all of the bolts to mount the ball links. A bag for all of the control rods. And then as well a bag for all of the control horns. Also included is some nice servo protector. So this can go around your servo wires and any other wires to help protect them against all of the sharp carbon edges in the fuse. The kit comes with a tail wheel, which has a really nice control mechanism, along with a tail wheel fairing. Lastly, included in the accessory box is the metal lightened backplate for the spinner, which of course bolts to the carbon fiber and pre-painted spinner on this plane. As well included in this kit, there is some of these fiber plated wood, which is for all of the vents on the bottom of the fuse. So depending on where your mufflers are coming out or how much venting you need, there is a plate that you can put over on the bottom of the fuse. As well, there is also the mounts for canisters, which of course, again, I don't need because I'm doing electric. Another nice feature is that inside there is some other pre-cut wood pieces for this is some kind of accessory mount. Uh, maybe I'll use that for my ESC. And then also they even include some of this, which is like um, a little frame you can build up to support the plane off its wheels, which is quite a nice feature for home storage and uh, extended storage. There you have everything that you're gonna find inside the Skywing 116 Edge kit. Next, I wanna go over my first impressions about the kit. Coming out of the box, the first thing I noticed is that the build quality on this thing is next level. I swear, there is not hardly a single wrinkle anywhere in the covering, on the fuse and all of the surfaces. All of the lines are crisp and clean and there's hardly any wrinkles anywhere and certainly if there is a wrinkle it could just be taken out with a little heat gun if I even bother to do so. The same goes for the quality of the paintwork on the canopy, cowl, wheel pants and spinner. Uh, all of the surfaces are really nice, the lines are crisp and clean. No excessive orange peel uh, kind of texture, no runs. Everything looks really, really well done. Personally, I'm super satisfied with the paintwork on this plane. Some of the features on this and other Skywing planes, which I of course love, is some things like the quick release canopy. This one has in total four little pins that just pull out and they're magnetic, so you can just stick them back in. Then the whole canopy can just really simply quick release and that's gonna be super beneficial for me since I'm doing electric, I'm gonna be changing batteries every flight, not having to uh, have a screwdriver and take out bolts and everything to get the canopy off is a huge benefit for me. 
Another thing that's really convenient about this plane is the quick release stab design. So this is another Skywing design where you just have a single magnetic dowel pin which uh, unlocks a little mechanism allowing you to quick release the elevators. Uh, also this plane has just a single pin hinge on the rudder which allows the rudder to be dismounted quickly as well which will really help me when I'm getting this in the car and to the flying field. Of course, as well, this plane has Skywing's um, quick release wing system, which is super simple. It's just these two little pins, which uh, push up, allow the wing to come in, and then you push them down. And then when you mount the canopy, it holds those pins down and in place so that your wings can never come off. I'm sure since the moment I said that I'm going to build this huge plane on electric power, you all have been asking, what power system is going to be in that thing? Well, it's time for me to show you. The powerful, beating heart of this plane is going to be the all-new Scorpion A7445 motor. Obviously, this is a huge motor, but you might even be thinking, that little motor is going to power that big plane? Well, let me tell you, this thing has some power density to it. The propeller I'm going to be pairing it with is the Falcon 30x12C2E, and this motor spins this prop up to around 6,000 RPM. And in case you don't know, a 150cc engine spins a 30 by 12 prop also to around 6,000 RPM. So that means that this motor is right up there in the 150cc class of engine. So much power in actually such a compact platform. To drive this motor, we have our Scorpion Tribunus 14-300 AMPSE, which is adequately sized for such a motor. This motor on a fresh charge battery with the biggest prop we've tested, which is actually a 32 by 10, pulls up to 225 amps, which is 10,000 watts of power. So we've got a good, big, solid ESC for that. Now a lot of you are probably thinking, wow, big electric planes are such a hassle. I have to charge so many batteries just to get a short flight time. Well, in the past that was true. On a plane this big, you would definitely need probably four 6S 5000 milliamp batteries to combine together in parallels and series in order to get around a 12S 10,000 milliamp battery. But times are changing and there's some new technology out there which I think is really going to revolutionize the giant electric airplane game. And that technology is 12S batteries and 12S chargers. So this battery here is one single pack. It is a 12S 10,000 milliamp brick, which is a monster battery. But the kicker here is I only have to charge one battery per flight. And with some of the new 12S chargers, such as the ISDT X16, it charges this battery in maybe 30, 35 minutes, and I can charge two at the same time because it's dual port. So like this, if I have two or three or four of these batteries, I only have to charge one per flight, and I could fly more or less consistently. In regard to flight time, this motor is super efficient. Spinning this prop up to 6,000 RPM is pulling only 190 amp, which is super low compared to motors of the past days. I was doing some testing with this motor on another airframe, and I was getting flight times up to 7 minutes long. And if I was doing 3D, around 5.5, which is very respectable for a giant electric airplane. In case you didn't notice as well, the surfaces on this plane are absolutely massive. So I knew I was going to need a monster servo to handle it, and that's why I have the new Expert MT-1000. This is a 1,000 ounce per inch servo, and it's really strong. I've been using it on some of my other planes, like the 91 inch Extra NG, and it's just been working great. So I think it's going to do awesome on this plane as well. One of the coolest features about the MT-1000 is that it has a removable servo plug. Now, what that means is, of course, if you need to change a servo, you don't need to pull your wiring all out. You can just unplug it right at the base. That's convenient. But the more cool thing is that different servos need different lengths of lead. Let's say on my ailerons, my outboard servo needs a much longer extension than my inboard servo does. Rather than take my fixed servo lead and have to put extension on extension, I can just have different lengths of servo wires which plug in. For example, here I have a really long one, which I'm going to use for my outboard aileron, and then I have a quite shorter one, which is going to be used for my inboard aileron. So that's a really awesome feature about these servos that I love, and uh, I'll be showing that more as we go along. Alright, so the first thing I want to get out of the way 
is all of the gluing of the control horns because I really hate this step. So I like to just get it out of the way at the front. So uh, there's a bag inside the accessory box which has all of the control horns. A nice feature that I like is that they are all labeled. So there's four for the rudder, four for the elevator, and eight in total for the wing. As well included is these plates that have the two slots in them which uh, help hold the control horn onto the surface. A couple things to note. On the rudder control horns, there is two versions. Let's call them side A and side B. Just make sure that side, both side A's go on one side and both side B's go on the other side because they kind of interlock like this um, in the rudder. So just make sure you don't put an A and a B on one side and a B and an A on the other side because then it might not work uh, and it wouldn't line up properly. The elevators, nothing to note, they're all equal. So on the aileron control horns, there is actually two lengths of them. There is a short one, which is signified by a single slot in the bottom of the control horn. And there is a long one, which is signified by two slots in the bottom of the control horn. So the short one goes at the root of the aileron, and the long one goes at the tip of the aileron. So this is to, because the wing is thinner at the tip, the control horn needs to be longer in order to keep the proportion between the um, center of the hinge line and the surface equal. So make sure you note that. On these little flat pieces, I did note sometimes they have this kind of film that gets stuck on them. Uh, I've seen it a couple times before on some of my other planes as well. So if you see that, just make sure you pull it off. Otherwise it might interfere with the grooving process. First thing I'm gonna do is go ahead and scuff up these control horns. So the area of the control horn which goes into the surface, I'm gonna make sure that it gets scuffed up really good so that it has some extra grip. Same for these flat pieces with the slot, I'm gonna scuff one side of them just to help with the adhesion. Next thing I'm gonna do is cut away the covering around the base of the control horn. I don't think this needs to be a very precise step. I'm just gonna kind of visually place this on here and get an idea of how much I need to cut. Once I've done that, I'm gonna clean up everything really good, and then I'm gonna go ahead and use some 15 minute z -poxy to glue these in. I will probably break it up into either two or three batches, uh, just to make sure I have enough time. Before we start gluing, I'm gonna give you a tip that my dad taught me. So when we're gluing, of course, we have to take some paper towels and rubbing alcohol to wipe off and clean up the excess epoxy. Uh, if you have a big piece of paper like this, it's really easy to wipe and then get it on your fingers or get it back on the surface. So what I always do when I'm preparing to uh, glue anything is I take my paper towels and I cut them up into smaller sections, like so. So I'll make a bunch of these and then I'll get it all wet, I'll spray it all down with alcohol, make sure it's all soaked. And then what I can do is rather than have one big towel, I just have smaller towels, which I can just take, wipe, throw, take, wipe, throw. And it helps to uh, keep epoxy off your fingertips and off your surfaces. So that's just one, one tip of the day. Before I actually mix glue, I am gonna go through and dry fit everything. So I will try to fit the individual control horns onto these uh, flat pieces with the slot to make sure that they actually go in. I found a fair few of these which were a little undersized, so I just took a small file and uh, made them a little bit bigger so that everything slid into place nicely. Then I'll go through and actually make sure that they fit into the control horns, uh, into the control surfaces themselves, uh, just to make sure there's no glue inside the slot or anything like this that would prevent it from going all the way down. Once I have that done, I'll go ahead and mix up the epoxy I'll take a small stick that has a, comes to a fine point. That way I can really goop the glue onto the control surface and make sure to get it down in the slots. I will put glue on the surface itself and on the control horn itself, and then go ahead and put it into place. I'll take my little pieces of paper towel drenched in rubbing alcohol and make sure that I get away all of the glue while it's still wet, and then go ahead and let this dry. While doing the elevators and rudder, I found that using 15 minute epoxy, I could only get about three of the control horns in before the glue started to dry. So I mixed up a fresh, a fresh batch of epoxy for the fourth one. 
So when I do the wings, I'm going to actually um, do them in two separate batches. So I'll do one batch for one wing with the two control horns and another batch for the other wing with the two control horns. Ensure on the ailerons that you have the proper control horn in the proper slot. As I mentioned before, on the inboard uh, aileron control horn, it's the one that is a little bit shorter, signified by a single slot in the control horn. And the one towards the tip has two slots in the bottom of the control horn, and it's a bit longer. So once again, just make sure you pay attention that you have those aligned properly, and a short with a short, and a long with a long, in the proper position. One thing to note when doing these control horns is that when you put it in, they can kind of want to push out. So go ahead and make sure that you uh, keep some pressure on them, keep an eye on them, and make sure that they're staying down and well compressed. Okay, now I've got all of the control horns glued in on the elevators, rudders, and ailerons. Uh, now I'm tired of like leaning over and doing this, so I think I'm just going to sit down and make up the ball links. I don't know what length they need to be, but I'm just going to make them... I'm just going to thread them in to an approximate length. All of the linkages themselves are the same length, so there's not ones that are specific for a specific surface. Uh, they are turnbuckles, meaning one side is counterclockwise threads and the other is clockwise threads. What I do is I put the clockwise rotating one uh, towards the servo. So that's just how I do it every single time. Uh, there's two different kind of ball links, one that is for servo side and one that is for control surface side. So just make sure you pay attention to that. Now that we've got all control horns glued on and the ball links made up, I'm going to get into actually mounting the electronics in this plane. On these servos, if this was a gas plane or any other application, I for sure would use the servo grommets. On this plane, since it's going to be electric, I think the vibration is going to be very low. I'm going to go ahead and go grommet this on this plane. What I've been doing recently is I take a wood screw that has a countersunk head on the top. So the screws that are flat on the top and come to an angle at the bottom. And what those do is they fit really nicely in the opening of the servo and they keep the servo super centered and super precisely mounted. Mounting the aileron servos in the wing is pretty straightforward. Uh, the orientation of the servo is notated by a piece of wood that's glued into the servo bay that has a laser etching of which direction the servo horn needs to go. As mentioned, uh, the Expert MT-1000 servos have a removable servo wire, which allows me to customize the length of the wire that I need. So I'm gonna go through and I'm gonna find what length of wire I need for this, uh, this wing. I have several lengths to choose from, and I'll go ahead and let you know on the screen what length I end up choosing. I did note that the servo pocket was a little small for this servo, so you can take something like a hand file or a Dremel even to open up the servo pocket a little bit um, just to make it fit easier for this servo. Many planes do this, but it's a super nice feature that they run a string through the wing, which allows you to tie onto your servo extension and helps you to pull it through the wing. When it comes time to mount the servo, I'm going to take a drill with a small bit and make four pilot holes for each servo. I will take a screw, thread it in, then thread it out, put some thin CA in the hole to really form and solidify those threads, and then I'll go ahead and do the final tightening of the servo screws. All right, moving on to the second wing, I'm going to follow the same process. I'll have to open up those servo pockets a little bit, uh, run the wires, drill the holes, screw in a screw and screw it out to form the threads, put some CA in the hole to form those threads uh, more stiffly, and then go ahead and do the final assembly on the servo. Moving on to mounting the servos in the elevator. Uh, again, there's a little piece of uh, wood stuck in the bay that shows you the orientation of the servo. So it goes towards the back, towards the hinge. The holes for mounting the servos are pre-drilled, so I won't need to somehow get a drill bit in there, which is nice. I ended up having to elongate the servo pocket ever so slightly with a hand file. It only took a couple minutes, so it was no big deal. Now to get these screws in, it's quite a far reach, so that's where a tool like the Scorpion Ratchet Driver comes in handy with the extendable shaft, which will, should allow me easy access in here to get those screws tightened down. On the second elevator, it will be the same process. I'll preemptively open up the servo pocket, thread the wire in, mount the servo, and screw it in. Mounting the elevator servos, it's... It's never fun. It's a ton of wiggling and trying to make it the servo happen to fall in the slot. 
First manufacturer who makes an elevator servo that mounts easier than this is you get the gold prize. But uh, with the proper tools, uh, I made it work. Now that I've got all control horns glued in and the servos mounted, I'm going to go ahead and move on to the fuselage. Now on a plane build with the fuselage, the first thing I normally do is I get it up on the landing gear. However, with this plane, since it's so big, I think I'm actually going to keep the landing gear off, keeping the plane lower and easier to work on while I'm mounting the servos, receiver, motor, ESC, and all of the other electronics. The covering for the servo pocket on the rudder servos is not cut out, but it is noted by a little arrow here. I'll take a sharp knife and cut out the covering around the servo pockets. On this plane, they say it's optional to run either one rudder servo or two rudder servos. Even though I have servos that have 1,000 ounces of torque per inch, I'm still going to run two of them. In regard to the servo extensions, this plane does come with pre-plumbed uh, and very long servo extensions. For mounting the servo, I'm going to use the same process as the wings. I'm going to take a drill, drill four small holes, screw in a screw, screw it out, hit those threads with some thin CA to really solidify them, then do the final installation of the screws. The next thing I'm going to do is shift my focus towards some of the component installation. Predominantly the battery mounting. This plane was obviously not intended for big electric setups, so the compartment area in here and the layout is not really set up for to hold a big LiPo battery or anything like that. So I need to take a look here and see what's my best plan of action. Either I need to come up with some kind of reinforcement and Velcro straps, or make some kind of sliding battery tray, maybe do some modifications here and there. So I'm going to take some time and I'm going to look at that and then I'll let you guys know what I come up with. I assume there'd be some cutting and grinding, which is why I wanted to figure out this battery mounting before I got any of my other electronics in it. But I think I came up with a pretty nice solution. So there was one former here uh, in the middle which was just completely in the way. It was keeping me from getting a battery in even without any kind of uh, battery plate or tray. So I just cut that piece out. Um, it was pretty flimsy to start with so I don't think it was really contributing to the structure very much. Then I came up with a kind of interlocking battery plate mechanism. So what I have here is a battery plate which I've cut out of some plywood. It's got three fingers here on the front which interlock into three slots that I've cut in the front of the firewall. So I didn't make them too wide so I'm pretty sure it won't affect the structure of the firewall at all and it should be plenty strong to hold in the battery. So with this system, the, uh, the whole thing can just slide in. It interlocks into those front fingers and then the battery is in there and secure. So uh, of course I will need to find some way to uh, fix it here at the back. Uh, I'll worry about that later. I'll probably just end up gluing some kind of reinforcement down and then put some sort of strap or a bolt or something on the back side here. If the back side doesn't move, then the front can't move. So that's the intention here. I'll definitely go through and refine this and finish it up later. But the main thing I wanted to do is just figure out how I was going to do it and get these initial cuts for the fingers and these cuts into the firewall done. Now that all the cutting and grinding is done, I'm going to go ahead and proceed with my radio installation. I started plugging in and powering up my servos, that way I could do the control linkage uh, mounting and the control surface setup. I am putting the surfaces on, on the wrong side, upside down. Uh, I put the left on the right side, the right on the left side, upside down. I do this so that it's just easier to get to those control linkages while I'm mounting and doing the initial setup. Of course, if you do this, you need to put everything back the right way and double check your directions and your trims and everything. But th this is just one little hack that I do to make my life a little bit easier during the build. I did the same thing on the wings, nothing big to report here. Uh, displaying on the screen, I will put the length of the linkages that I ended up using. That way on your own plane, you can just copy that if need be. After getting the linkages on and the control surfaces set, I started moving on to my wiring. I started getting everything plugged in, making up my power, my servo power wire harnesses. Uh, I made up some custom length servo extensions for the ailerons. And then as well, I started making the custom cables that I need to go from my ESC, which will be up in the front, all the way back to the receiver in the back here. It's really nice on this plane. There is a small plastic tube uh, that goes from the front of the fuselage back to the middle of it, which allowed me to really easily get my cables installed. 
So now it's time to move on to the power system installation. As I said, I'm going to be using the new prototype Scorpion A7445 motor. And this is going to come with our cross mount and standoff set as part of the PNP combo with our Tribunus 14 300 amp ESC. The great thing about this cross mount and standoff set is that it's designed to bolt directly onto the front of the plane. There's a standard now. Uh, most of these planes pre-drill or at least pre-mark their firewalls for um, a spacing that's common to most 150cc or 170cc gas engines. And also, of course, that size of a 150 to 170cc engine is pretty standard. So most planes, they have the engine plus the fixed standoff spacing. And uh, what we've done with this cross mount and standoff set is we've matched that. As you can see on this plane, the firewall is pre-drilled and this spacing matches up perfectly. And as far as the spacing, Skywing says on their website that it's 215 millimeters from the firewall to the front of the cowl. This motor with the standoffs is at 205 and then we include some spacers so you can space it out. I'm going to add in a total of 12 millimeters of spacers, which will give me 215 for the firewall to the cowl plus two millimeters of space for um, space between my cowl and my spinner. After test fitting the cowl, everything seems like it's lining up perfectly. This is Kyle from the future coming to talk to you about ESC mounting and ESC cooling. The first flights of this plane, I just had the ESC mounted here under the motor box of the plane. I didn't put any baffling or any other kind of cooling and I assumed everything would be fine. On the first flight, I was flying with the cowl off and everything was working great. The motor was cool and the ESC was cool. However, then I put the cowl on and things changed. The motor was still running cool, but the ESC started to run hot, really hot. Of course, with any high power electronic device, you need adequate cooling. So the fact that without the cowl, it was fine and with the cowl, it's not, it means there's an issue with my cooling. So I'm going to explain to you my new version and how it works. So the cowl does have this big hole right here in the middle, which does line up with the ESC. However, I don't think that air was making to it. My, my theory is that the air is going in this hole and then sticking to the bottom of the cowl and going out the bottom of the fuse. So the first thing we need to do is add some baffling. I've created this out of some two millimeter light balsa wood. It's very lightweight and also quite uh, flexible, as you can see. So I'll just glue this into place around this hole, which will direct the air directly to the ESC and around the ESC. The second thing I've done is I've mounted the ESC on an angle. That way that air is not just hitting one side of the ESC, but it's hitting across the whole top face and the heat sink and the capacitors of this ESC. Of course, if we direct this air in, we need to let it out somewhere. There's of course on the bottom of the fuse, some cutouts that you can cut and put a grate over to allow that air to get out. If all of that is still not enough, there is still the Scorpion high speed 40 millimeter cooling pan, which I can mount in if needed. The landing gear mount easily with just four bolts. Uh, if you're looking for the bolts, do note that they are already pre-mounted into the bottom of the fuselage. So just unbolt them, put some Loctite, and then bolt your landing gear back on. As well, I'm going to get the tail wheel mounted. Mounting the tail wheel is super self-explanatory. There's this little fairing. The tail wheel goes inside the fairing, and then it mounts with two bolts. One thing to note, the hinge pin that holds the rudder on, at the bottom it bends 90 degrees. It goes into a slot in the fuselage and then part of this tail wheel fairing is what actually holds that pin in place and keeps it from coming out. Last thing to note, for the tail wheel control rod, uh, you do have to kind of bend it up in a zig and then a zag to get it to align up to this ball link that's in the rudder. Next up we'll be mounting the landing gear fairings. There's some rubber edge protector included in the kit. Make sure you glue that on to the fairing. Go ahead and do a trial, a dry trial fit of the wheel fairing. Sometimes they require a little modification. Then I'm going to dry mount the fairing, use some blue tape to mark where the edge of it is, pull that fairing off, take some silicone glue all around the landing gear in a nice big healthy blob, and then put that wheel fairing on and tape it into position and let it dry overnight. Now that that has dried, we'll continue with the wheel mounting. This plane uses Skywing's patented axle design, which is really nice. It has a section of the axle, which is for the wheel. Then it steps down a millimeter to another, a smaller section with a threaded nut. This allows you to put the wheel on and then put, screw that nut all the way down without it bottoming up against the wheel, causing it to bind. The other side of the axle just mounts on with a nut and then the wheel pan mounts on with two bolts 
Plus, there's a third counter support on the other side of the axle with a single bolt that goes through the wheel pan and into the axle, really supporting your wheel pan really nicely. I did change the baffling in the Cala. Originally, it's for a gas engine and directs air over the engine heads. I changed it for electric style, which directs air towards the center where my motor will be. I used the structure of the existing baffles and then added some foam EVA to make it suit my application. After this, the build is all but done. The only thing left to do is mount the prop and spinner. I got the plane together for one last final check. I was checking the servo directions, checking the gyro directions, and then also I was checking the CG. Skyring says on their planes that the CG should be canopy off and just lift up on the wing tube. So I'm going to start like that as a starting point. Uh, it worked out pretty good with the battery. Uh, it's pretty far up in the nose, but I still have room to go forwards or backwards a fair bit for my CG adjustment. And with that, we conclude the build of the Skywing 116 inch edge with the Scorpion A7445 motor system. Of course, this motor and ESC combo is produced by Scorpion Power Systems, but thank you as well to my other sponsors, Expert RC, for providing the MT1000 servos. Thank you to Mikado for providing the VBAR Neo receiver and gyro setup, as well as the VBAR Control Touch radio system. And thank you as well to Skywing for helping me get this beautiful plane which we're going to use for the testing of the Scorpion A7445 motor. Stay tuned for the flight review video which will be coming out shortly.